University of Sydney for their help coordinating the project. So just a brief introduction. Um, annual ryegrass is considered to be an annual winter weed. And its seeds are usually dormant for around eight to nine weeks. And then after about some significant rain in the autumn and winter or winter season, you get some germination in field conditions. However, sometimes um, it has been observed that this plant has been growing and germinating in summer. Um, and this image on the right here is just a image of some ryegrass growing in a cotton crop during summer. So the, um, some experiments that I conducted that I'm going to talk about today looked into the growth and the development of um, winter growing versus summer growing plants and the seed production of these plants, um, comparing the differences and looking at if there's any difference when they're grown in winter versus summer. So I established one experiment in May 2019 and a second experiment in January of this year. So these corresponding to winter season last year and the summer season at the beginning of this year. And in each of these experiments, I used 10 winter populations. So these were populations that had grown in winter and were collected um, once they mature. And then in the first experiment, um, uh, I had seven summer populations. So naturally growing, occurring summer populations. And in the second experiment, um, one extra summer population was included. And the image here just shows how this experiment was set up um, with, uh, with pots and a single plant in each pot. So the first data that I collected for this experiment were how many days it took for these plants to reach and to emerge from uh, potting mix, as well as then looking how long it took them to reach their fourth leaf stage. And so what I want to point out here, um, well, first of all, these graphs have the, these black bars represent winter, naturally occurring winter populations, and the gray bars are the summer populations. And I've further divided each graph into the first experiment, the winter experiment, and then the summer experiment as well. So when we look just at the winter experiment, there's not really much difference in how long it took for these plants to emerge to, between summer and winter populations. Uh, but there was, you know, a, on average about a day or two difference between the um, winter and summer populations of these summer experiment. Uh, the more interesting uh, thing to note here is just how how much quicker they tended to emerge when they were when they were uh, planted in summer. Um, or, you know, all, about half they took about half the time to emerge. Then when we look over at the fourth leaf, uh, how long it took to reach for, fourth leaf stage? Again, there's this difference between the winter experiment and the summer experiment, with plants generally. Uh, taking a shorter amount of time to reach this fourth leaf stage. Um, and, but you can also see there was a bit of a difference between the winter and the summer populations for both experiments with summer tending to take a few extra days to reach this, um, this stage. But then when we go a bit further and we look at how many days it took to start for the plants to start producing heads, and flowering, um, it, it starts telling uh, another story here. Um, and just quickly for the maturity data here, how many days it took to reach maturity, the data here is missing for the summer uh, experiment because these plants are still currently growing. They're, they're starting to reach maturity about this stage, but the data is just um, not there yet. Uh, but so thinking back to the last slide, some when we grow plants in summer, regardless if they're winter or summer occurring, they tended to emerge quicker and um, and then reach the fourth leaf stage quicker. But they took 
much longer to develop heads and to reach flowering. And so we're seeing that even though they have this quick um, initial growth, they then start having a bit of a, uh, the growth starts falling off and they, and they don't really develop really until they start experiencing the cold temperatures, which seems to then signal them to uh, produce heads. And so even though they're germinating at the beginning of the year, um, they're still not really going to, de to develop in the same time frame as they normally would for um, if they were winter populations. And so continuing from this, um, I've got a graph here showing data that I, that I took of the height of each population every four weeks. So um, the dots here, um, I'll just go over, they represent uh, for the black dots and the red squares, these are the winter and summer populations of the first experiment, the winter experiment, and the blue and yellow uh, winter and summer populations of the summer experiment. And you can clearly see from these results that when they are germinating in winter, they have much higher, uh, they grow much taller than when they're germinating in the in summer conditions. And this growth is also very, very steadily increases throughout uh, uh, throughout the year. Whereas this some these summer germinating plants, regardless if they're naturally winter or summer um, occurring, seem to have this plateau effect of the uh, on their height until they pick up once they start developing these heads and um, towards the, the end of their, uh, their life cycle. But this really is much more delayed when compared to growing in winter. And the other thing to note really is just the winter populations for both experiments were on average taller than the summer plants. Although this seemed to change just for the last um, data point collected here. For the rest of the talk, I'm just going to be giving some data on uh, some parameters collected for the winter um, experiment only, as these refer to data collected after maturity. And as I mentioned, those plants that I grew, uh, started growing in summer are still actually uh, maturing now. So this slide is covering biomass differences between winter and summer populations when they are grown in, in winter. And it's pretty uh, clear to see that on average, winter populations produce more biomass. So the total shoot dry weight, which is the above ground portion of the plant, was higher in winter, the same as how many uh, of the seeds, uh, the seed weight per tiller and the total seed weight of the plant. And so these are individual um, referring to individual seeds, uh, individual plants. But then when we look at the actual number of tillers and the number of seeds being produced, um, the change in biomass is not really reflected here. And there's not that much difference between winter and summer populations with how many tillers or how many seeds they produce. And so thinking back to the height data and the biomass data, it, uh, for at least for these populations that were analyzed, um, again, this was 10 winter populations, seven summer populations. For these populations, the plants are growing taller. They have more mass in both the shoot and the, and the seeds, but they're not actually tillering more. They're not producing more seeds. So um, the seeds are just of a smaller size. And so this could have an effect on you know, the um, how you know how much energy reserves the seed may have uh, when um, after it matures and the potential for it to to germinate. Uh, the last data, amount of data that um, I collected for this experiment looked into analyzing the dormancy of the seeds that I harvested from each of these. And um, again, this is only for the winter 
experiment as I still have to harvest the seeds for the summer experiment. Uh, but for this experiment, I tested germination of each population shortly after seed collection, 45 days after seed collection and 90 days after seed collection. And I considered that dormancy had been lost once germination had reached um, above 85%. Um, these experiments were all tested at 25 degree day temperature, 15 degree night temperature. Um, and this temperature was chosen based on some previous uh, temperature experiments, um, as well as some previous publications that seem to indicate that this was um, the optimum temperature for germination. So just to rule out temperature effect and focus solely on dormancy, um, this temperature was, um, was used. And looking at the table here, so this first column um, of data here is, as I said, the um, taking after seed collection, then there was 45 days after that and um, another 45 days after that. And I've indicated in with a gray background and bold font here, the, pop, the populations which have lost dormancy. So after seed collection, um, it was interesting to note that mo no populations had yet lost all of their dormancy, but the germination was fairly high. And in some populations like W9 or S4, um, so this W being winter, S being summer, um, these populations had fairly high germination. Uh, and the other ones still had, you know, maybe around 50% germination. So there was only really some moderate dormancy in these populations. Then after 45 days, almost all of the populations had lost their dormancy. Uh, only two still remain, still retain some dormancy, although the germination was still fairly high. And then taking another 45 days, these populations have both lost the dormancy. And the, really the, um, the take home message from this data is that this 90 days is really corresponds with the end of summer. So these populations, the, they were harvested, um, sometime in November and all, and around the end of uh, Feb February, they had pretty much all lost their dormancy. And most of them with this 45 days, this is about the middle of summer. So it shows that these populations, even the winter, the naturally occurring winter populations, even at seed collection, they still had only some moderate dormancy. Some seeds can still germinate. And almost all of the seeds were able to germinate after 45 days. So it's, show, it's showing here that these populations have the potential to germinate in summer. And um, some data that I haven't shown here is some temperature um, experiments that I've conducted um, at the moment just on the winter populations and they will soon be completed for the um, summer populations, but at least these winter populations can germinate in temperatures up to 35 um, degree day temperatures. So they really do have the potential to, ge to germinate in summer and grow throughout summer. Um, uh, just to finish off my presentation, I've, I'm just going to recap the three main um, conclusions that I have from um, from all of the, the this data. The first being that ryegrass germinating in summer takes a longer time to develop and mature and is generally shorter and, than plants um, when they grow in, during winter. Uh, also, when germinating in the autumn or winter season, the winter populations produce more biomass, but the number of seeds are not really different to the summer population. So they're still producing similar amounts of, of seeds. Um, and finally, just about the dormancy to recap. So seeds produced by both winter and summer populations germinating in the autumn or winter seasons, they can still lose their dormancy and germinate during summer. Um, 
I just want to put out uh, a call to anyone who in the upcoming summer season, if they find any, any more ryegrass growing to contact myself or uh, Bagarat, because um, we'd love to be able to come and uh, collect some more seeds if, um, if anybody has, uh, had, finds any uh, in this coming season. Uh, and uh, thank you. I'll have a look at the, uh, the chat. All right, that's really good, Michael. So you've got one question there in the chat. Uh, have you managed to track the, the chat section down yet? Um, one moment. Yes, okay. Um, did you check seed fill and seed viability? Um, no, so, well, for the seed viability, um, basically when we checked the seeds, so when for the, um, for any, for the experiments, sowing them in pots, as well as germination experiments for the dormancy, uh, before taking, before using those seeds, they were all checked that, you know, they had, they were firm seeds. They're usually, ryegrass has a bit of a, a black color to kind of, um, for the embryo to kind of indicate vi viability. Um, and so only seeds that, that um, we felt were viable were used. Um, but we, at that point, we didn't check via like any x-ray or um, something like that. Um, for the dormancy experiments, uh, when, after we performed the experiments, so they went for about um, four weeks and at the end of that experiment, I used um, gibberellic acid to try to um, stimulate the, to break the dormancy in any remaining seeds to, and pr prompted them to ger germinate um, if he, uh, despite having still some dormancy. Okay, so from Vicky, um, have any understanding for how widespread or frequent summer populations are? So it seems um, from at least for the populations that we collected in that I've shown in the data for in here, all of these populations were kind of collected around um, Griffith. There, that seems to be the main area for summer populations around um, around that kind of area in New South Wales. Um, I've got some seeds that um, that seem to have uh, that have grown around Corindai as well. Um, the frequency of the populations it, it doesn't seem. Um, Oh, as Bagrath's just saying, some taken from uh, Crocker Creek also, so a bit further north in um, New South Wales. Um, yeah, going back to the frequency of the populations occurring, it, it really seems very much tied to um, irrigation. There, it's not that common at the moment, um, and which you know, I've found for the, this experiment, it has been a bit difficult to track down um, these populations. Um, of course, I, you know, I could, have, could easily miss um, some populations, but from, from my, um, you know, trying to track down populations and coordinating with other people, it's not that frequent and quite a lot of um, growers don't really know that it's, that it's even a problem, um, but definitely, uh, particularly when you start getting down more to Griffith, it's you really start. Um, that's where I think more um, of the these populations are occurring, and mostly around like irrigated areas, because I think they need that um, you know that constant water um, water source to 
really continue that growth under that, those high temperatures. Um, yeah, Michael, I think it's probably fair to say that um, you started looking for these populations during the middle of a drought. Um, yeah, so that's, that's true lo too. Locations are probably, the populations you collected at the moment correlate with where there's been a history of ryegrass and, and where there's been water. Yeah. A little bit yeah, too early. So at different times, uh, you know, different amounts of rainfall, yeah, they might start, start um, cropping up, uh, popping up a lot more widespread, a lot more frequent. Um, okay, so Leslie said, are you planning to look at genetic differences among summer and winter populations? Um, yes. So I'm going to be looking at some, taking um, some dart seek uh, analysis of winter and summer, of individual plants from winter and summer populations um, to genotype um, each individual and then have a look at the very vari variation. So genetic diversity between, uh, between the species as well as within the species. Um, and then there, there will, there is some going to be some work done to try to identify any genet genetic regions related with dormancy that might be, um, you know, there might be some alleles that are different between winter and summer populations. Um, but yes, that's very much um, on the to-do list for the very near future. So I've got a question for you, Michael. It's in relation to the, um, the transition from vegetative growth to reproductive growth in the, the summer planted its experiments. Um, you indicated that it wasn't until the, um, the plants are exposed to cooler temperatures that that began to occur. Yep. Um, was it cooler temperatures or maybe longer days that, that caused that transition, do you think? Yeah, it, it could um, be both the day length or the temperature. Um, I think um, given, you know, it's a, this species is kind of known as have, requiring that vernalization period. Um, I, th I think it might likely be the, the cooler temperatures, but it could be a combination of both. It could be one or the other, but um, yeah, so I don't know. I haven't looked, in, haven't looked into that specifically. Yeah, I mean, you could easily check back on the temperature records and the, um, the dates to figure that one yeah. out. Yeah, that actually is, I um, have planned to have a, have a look at that. Um, yeah. Uh, and the other question I had for you too, what was the, um, the seed storage environment for the dormancy testing? Yeah, so they're kept um, in some containers. So just um, airtight containers. We keep it in dark conditions and it's just been um, like at room temperature in the lab. So probably around that 25 degree um, temperature. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that is pretty rapid dormancy loss in those conditions. Hmm. Yeah, as Bagrat said, room temperature, yeah. Okay, do we have any last questions for Michael? All right, no, that was really good, Michael. Thank you for that. All right, I'll hand it over to, to yeah. you. Bye. Thanks, Michael. Round of applause for Michael. All right, so now introducing Guy Coleman, who's going to uh, give us the latest information on the opportunity for laser weed control. Thanks, Michael. I'll just um, share the screen. Can you hear me and see that all right? That's good. Perfect. All right, so uh, as Michael said, uh, I'm going to give you an update on some of the laser weeding we've been doing uh, over the past, I guess, year since the last time we updated, um, updated you all on this. So uh, the team that's been sort of working on this uh, has been supported by uh, Chris Fetters and Sergio. Um, they're in the uh, University of Sydney um, Astrophotonics Instrumentation Laboratory, so they do a bit of astrophysics work and also help us out on the laser side of things. So I'd just like to acknowledge our support. 
So I guess the, the first question is, uh, well, why lasers? And I know we discussed this briefly um, sort of way back last year, but uh, and sort of a bit of the preemptive work to, before we decided to head down the laser path. But in a bit more detail, the, there's sort of four key points that uh, really um, support, I guess, our, our research and the use of lasers for broad acre production systems. Uh, and the first is that they have very uh, targeted energy. Uh, so on, on the right here, you'll see this um, diagram of what's called the inverse square law. And essentially for a, a spherical body, um, as you move uh, further away from, the, um, from that sort of source of, of radiation, so it could be uh, light, it could be uh, any sort of um, electromagnetic radiation anywhere along the spectrum. So it could be microwaves, uh, it could be heat energy. The intensity of that energy, as you can see here, uh, decreases by the, uh, the square value of the distance. So basically, as you get further away, it gets it decreases uh, a lot uh, over time. Um, sorry, I'm not sure that's all good. Um, so basically, it means the intensity rapidly declines as you move away from that spherical source. Uh, and, and there are ways you can sort of focus different types of radiation. And I guess that's why lasers are quite useful because while you can't sort of completely get away from the inverse square law, you can use uh, different lenses and optics uh, to focus that laser output from a, a point source into a very narrow beam that doesn't, uh, or the intensity isn't reduced um, as you see here uh, over such large distances. So while you can have defocused beams where, where lasers have a focal point and after that focal point, the intensity does reduce, um, you can also have collimated beams, like you might be familiar with uh, laser pointers for uh, in-person presentations um, or even actually virtual ones uh, these days. So the, the collimation means you can focus that beam into one point over large distances and there will be some energy loss, but it's, it's that ability to use optics to focus it uh, relatively easily. So you can have sort of uh, aspheric lenses here to do that. Uh, it means you can target this energy um, much more effectively. And there are ways of actually doing like dynamic targeting. So even as the, the um, the object moves further away from the laser, you can actually change lens or move that lens closer and further away from the laser itself to change that focal point if it's a, a non collimated beam. So that, that's the target of energy side of, side of things. Um, and the other is the high flexibility. So you can mount these in different configurations, you can have mirrors to move them around. And as you'll see later in the presentation, it doesn't just have to be a point like you can see with this laser pointer here. It, it can be a range of different shapes potentially. And also that they're relatively low energy. So a very high power laser used in say laser welding or uh, uh, sort of rust removal or, or things like that are, are often sort of under a thousand watts. And you, you can get significantly larger ones as well, uh, but they are sort of around like at a thousand watt uh, plus or minus the uh, efficiency of delivering that laser beam. That is, it could be around sort of 30% depending on the, um, the, the type of laser. But even so that's, that's relatively low uh, compared to other sort of influence. And again, they're, they're quite small and, and lightweight um, and they can be directed using a range of different sort of fiber optic um, methods. Anyway, that, that's sort of why we went down this laser path, uh, sort of set the scene for a bit of our research. And so uh, during this sort of research process, we've been guided by the question uh, as to whether or not lasers are relevant as a sort of novel form of weed control in broad acre production systems. So can they be used on grain farms uh, and uh, will they sort of fit in that cropping system? Now the specific aims for this research have, have been to identify the efficacy of lasers. Um, and so how much energy uh, sort of per unit area is required for control. And as you can see here, looking at if species, so the annual ryegrass on the top and uh, turnip weed on the bottom as just two examples, uh, do species and growth stage influence that control energy? Uh, so that's sort of the three sort of main uh, aims we've been looking at and we'll address those as we go through this presentation. So the first experiments we did, we sort of picked out um, some energy densities or based off very, very preliminary work on the much smaller lasers. And uh, we basically had four species. So in winter over uh, 2019 and uh, winter 2020, uh, we tested annual ryegrass and turnip weed. Um, and also summer 2020, earlier this year, we, we did all, all this binding up grass and south as which you can see, uh, this is up in Narrabri um, experiment there. And we tested five energy densities. So energy density is the uh, power of the laser. So in this case, it's 25 watts uh, multiplied by the time. So this was uh, one second 
two seconds, five seconds, 15 and 60 seconds, um, and divided by the area of the beam. So it's a five millimeter beam width. This is a defocused laser. So that five millimeter beam width was achieved about, uh, I think it's 40 millimeters, uh, I think 43 millimeters away from the edge of that lens to be precise. So that's how you calculate energy density. That's basically how distributed that energy is over that sort of uh, beam area. And it means you can try and compare between different lasers and different power and, and all that sort of thing. Um, but obviously, of course, there are sort of confounding factors. And then we also tried four different growth stages. So uh, like we saw in that previous photo. And uh, this is the, the setup. So you have an interlock for safety um, and also internal cameras and um, the lasers delivered by this fiber optic uh, cable. So this is what it looks like inside. I risked uh, my phone and it's infrared uh, filter. Um, and basically uh, you can see the, uh, the laser beam is that sort of misty uh, pink light that's sort of saturating the IR filter. And this is a turn of weed. So it's heating it up and the sort of plant, um, I guess, shrivels up and, and is heated. And we didn't actually see if this was controlled. So judging by our charts, we'll see shortly, it was, it was probably likely controlled. This is 30 seconds sped up three times to about 38.1 joules per square millimeter. And these are the results from that, that first trial. So I won't give you the, the charts for every, uh, every species we tested. So I'll just stick with annual ryegrass sort of, uh, as Michael introduced it as. Uh, but this is quite um, similar uh, for, uh, for, those all, uh, for those species. And what you see here is the laser energy dose, which is that, again, that joules per square millimeter. So the, uh, the, that energy density. And then on the left-hand side is the uh, annual ryegrass biomass as a percent of the, uh, the untreated control. So, the uh, first two growth stages, which were about the three uh, sort of three leaf stage and seven leaf stage, uh, there was uh, not bad control. So by uh, um, 19 joules, uh, we saw, I think, effectively 100% control of the, uh, the four, so three leaf growth stage, the, the youngest plants. And by the time we got to the uh, 76 joules, so about the 60 second treatment time, we had full control of um, both those two, uh, those two growth stages, so sort of seven leaf as well. But then when we got to the latest growth stages, the late tillering and mid tillering, uh, well, we saw some growth suppression in that sort of mid tillering and, and nothing really um, significantly up here. So that showed that we're probably sort of too far down that, that low energy end. Um, and this is sort of the, the visual uh, depiction of that. So you've got your uh, 1.3 sort of lowest treatment down here up to the control, that's your highest treatment there um, across those uh, four different species. So. As I mentioned, it was quite a similar story where the, the first two times of sowing were quite well controlled and then not too much uh, after that. Although we did see some differences in sensitivity um, at the lower times for the, the summer weeds. And this is the uh, next growth stage up. So again, so see less sensitivity to the, uh, the treatment, that full control at the highest level and just slight sort of differences in sensitivity for the, the summer species. Even though, interestingly, the south thistle was actually larger or had a large average biomass um, 21 days after treatment. So yeah, I should say here that this, these photos were taken um, at harvest, which was 21 days after treatment. So the plants didn't just sort of magically vaporize. Um, they sort of degraded and, and died over that three week period. So that sort of told us, I guess, that, that lack of control of the larger species, uh, the larger plants, um, sorry, that Basically, we, we needed to look at the higher ends of the energy spectrum. So uh, this time we, we aimed, we sort of targeted those energy densities um, more appropriately, I guess, for these sort of four growth stages. So uh, this, this was done just um, sort of a couple of months ago uh, over winter here uh, for annual ryegrass again and turnip wheat, and hopefully replicating this um, well for the summer species as well. Uh, but again, six energy densities. So one more energy density uh, tested the last time. Power tires, so again, that's the power of the laser, which is 25 watts, um, which is 25 joules per second. Again, by time divided by area, four growth stages, um, as you can see here for those two species, and uh, a maximum of 305 joules per uh, square millimeter, which is actually 240 seconds, which is a very long period of time. But we wanted to see if, all right, well, if we hit these for a long time, is it possible with this laser and this beam width uh, and this setup? And uh, this was the result. So this is for annual ryegrass. Uh, again, similar graph, laser energy dose down the bottom, uh, annual ryegrass untreated control, uh, percentage of the untreated control on the left here. And if you, this is the maximum dose we had in the previous experiments. That was around the 80 joules per square millimeter. 
uh, and now we extended up 300. And you can see that after that third growth stage, uh, there was well, decent or significant control of, um, of those plants. And we saw that growth suppression, which we didn't see of the, the biggest uh, weeds. Uh, so I guess we saw a suppression, but didn't see uh, consistent control like we saw of these plants and uh, these younger ones as well. And because of the, the timing of it, it was delayed slightly. So these um, earlier growth stages were a little bit larger than expected. So that's why you see a slightly larger increase uh, in energy required for complete control, given that was what we tested before. Um, and these are the visual uh, representation of that. So quite similar to before uh, for these younger growth stages, 21 days after, uh, after treatment. Uh, and you can see there's some more control than we saw previously uh, for those uh, ryegrass plants at the highest um, treatment. So the highest on the left down to the lowest um, control. So that 76.4 was the, the highest we tested last time. And we've gone up to the 305 joules per square milliliter um, this time around. And, and you can see there's sort of half the plants there. So with the turnip weed, it, similar story, but slightly more uh, resistant to the laser. So you can see those, those charts tended to be, um, or didn't decrease as much early on, uh, but then the, the end result was a little bit sort of uh, similar, I guess. Um, but yeah, so basically we didn't get that control or the full control that we, we might've hoped for. But what that does tell us, um, and again, so this is the visual representation of that, similar to what we saw previously. This is some interesting regrowth patterns here where we, we controlled the growing point in the center, but then the, uh, the turnip weed actually sort of bolted around that controlled growing point into this sort of multiple tiller uh, scenario or, or a sort of, yeah, flowering scenario, whereas you can see the control is just a single uh, stem. So basically we saw that for um, laser energy above that around 19 joules per millimeter or square millimeter, did provide consistent control of the three leaf um, weeds. And above that sort of 76 uh, joules per square millimeter was, was good for the seven leaf uh, weeds. So that's, that's what we saw, I guess, across uh, both um, of those experiments and for most of the species tested. Then we also saw substantial growth suppression uh, and some control, but not necessarily full control uh, of the late tillering annual ryegrass at that sort of 305 uh, joules per square millimeter, so that growth stage three and uh, some of the flowering tenor weed. Uh, but again, it wasn't sort of um, as sort of far back, I guess, as, as we um, might have thought. So what does that mean? Well, uh, firstly, it'd be good to repeat these studies so we do know that it's sort of accurate uh, and also long duration for those summer weeds. Uh, and there are indications that, as I'll get to next, that the larger spot size might be needed for these larger plants um, and some other sort of exploration of different laser variations. So I don't think this is the um, I guess the, the end of this sort of research, it seems, it's sort of just indicating uh, the start. So the implications for this, um, in terms of sort of rethinking our approach potentially away from just a single point size, is that, uh, well, firstly, that the control of small winter summer weeds is possible, I guess, as if, if you looked at it and you had some sort of effective targeting mechanism and weed detection apparatus. Um, but if we just keep on zapping these weeds for longer and longer with more and more energy, it doesn't seem like that's the most effective way to do this. Uh, so perhaps we need to look at the selected spot size and the shape of that, and whether that's actually appropriate uh, for this sort of weed control and this delivery option. And so that sort of gets us into the laser variations. Uh, we have a range of options available to us. The, a single point, uh, point like a laser beam, uh, sort of like a, like a laser pointer, which you might be familiar with, isn't, isn't the only option that we have available to us. Uh, there are different types of laser power delivery. So we used a continuous wave or a CW laser where it just holds the same energy intensity for the duration that you leave the laser on. Then you have things like quasi CW or quasi continuous wave and pulsed wave lasers, which have very high peak energy powers. Um, so they might have an average of 150 watts, um, whereas we tested 25 watts, but they have a uh, 100, well, one and a half thousand watt peak pulse. So they have very large peaks that average out to a, uh, to a sort of a significantly lower average power. And those pulses are only there for, for nanoseconds. But it does mean that uh, you, you can potentially heat up or ablate that material and get rid of it um, more effectively. So there has been some research in materials processing where these pulsed lasers to sort of penetrate more into the material for welding or paint removal 
sorts of um, applications than just continuous wave. So that's something we can look into. That's power delivery. There's also options on the beam shape. So we've just done little points um, like we've seen, but you, there are scanning heads uh, like this, which are used for um, laser cutting or laser etching, uh, or this is, a, this is a two axis one, uh, but you have three axis where it does the automatic focus for you as well. So it does the depth and um, which could be another option. But basically the, there's a laser fiber or beam that comes in, there's two sort of mirrors that are moved to direct that beam to individual spots. And if you couple that with a pulsed laser, you have high energy pulses across an area uh, very, very quickly. Whereas uh, previously we just do one sort of leaving it in one spot and, and uh, hoping the energy was spread out around the heating sort of zone. So this might uh, be an, another option um, that would be interested in trying. As so then we get to this, I guess, um, these sorts of rust removal lasers where they're lines. Um, and as you can sort of see, but it effectively sort of removes rust from that surface. The laser causes this, the laser pulses back, back along that sort of length. Um, and, and I guess it, it treats a much larger area than our five millimeter um, beam width. So that's something we, um, I guess, would be interested, very interested in trying uh, for laser weed control. So that that's bring, brings me to the end of the presentation. Um, if you have any questions, leave them in the, uh, the chat um, or uh, feel free to get in touch as well. I think. A spectacular finish to a presentation, Guy. <laughs> Um, interesting. Okay. Oh, there we go. The questions are finally come up. So Gulshan's got one here from um, just about the is there any relationship between leaf waxes and energy level. So similarly, is there any relationship between tap, adventitious root system, tuber system, and energy level? Uh, to be honest, I haven't looked at that, uh, Gulshan. Uh, so can't really comment too much. Um, yeah, I guess that. If you have high enough laser power, potentially it might not matter. <laughs> um, in terms of the root systems, uh, what I did notice with um, the uh, turnip weed is that we sort of started to see a, a swap in, in sensitivity. So the very early growth stage uh, ryegrass, uh, where the so just the cotyledon, basically the single leaf coming out of the ground, uh, where the, because the growth growing point was below the soil surface. The laser uh, it often regrew out of the sort of uh, the burnt uh, remains of its um, sort of uh, the cotyledon there before. So, but but with turnip weed, it, because the growing point was at the top, it it, uh, it was effectively controlled. But when that switched around to older uh, plants, uh, and potentially because of the, the really sort of fat sort of um, uh, woody sort of uh, root system of the uh, the turnip weed right at the base of the plant, the turnip weed tended to be more uh, uh, resistant to those um, to that uh, laser when compared to the to the ryegrass. It's still early days, um, but yeah, we have to look at root systems differently to see how that would um, affect the laser control. So as Leslie's asked one here on uh, what's the next step in development or selection of pulse lasers uh, for cost-effective application. Um, pulse, yeah, it'd be an interesting one. Uh, it'd be nice to try. Uh, I guess. Have the opportunity to try a pulse laser. Um, probably uh, even just to test one out at a unit. Um, if someone has one <laughs> they use for laser welding, I think, um, or, or, or look at uh, purchasing one or some sort of thing. I'm not sure the exact steps. Um, Michael might be able to talk more about that. But um, I think just look at yeah, look at if there is a difference between a pulse laser and this the CW laser in terms of research. It's a good question, um, Leslie and Guy, that um, we're sort of in that area of the unknown where it's, it's, uh, we're trying to do some cheap and preliminary studies that can give us some clear direction on the sort of size and types of lasers that we're going to need for the future. So it's, um, yeah, it's tricky to, to, uh, to make those decisions around what sort of equipment we need to purchase for the, the next lot of studies and to, I guess, hopefully choose the right direction. Yeah, hold on. And yeah, I guess the other comment too I'd have, Guy, is that, um, and it's in relation to, to Golshan's comment, uh, we're, we're sort of 
have been finessing a little bit with the, the small lasers that we've got at the moment, just because they are small lasers. In terms of weed control, um, it's pretty clear the bigger the laser, the better is going to be what we need to be looking at. Um, we want to be able to control those big weeds as well as the, the smaller weeds. So uh, these studies are giving us a bit of an indication of just how much energy we do need to, to kill the different weed sizes. Yeah, I'd probably just say that the, the total amount of energy, because the, the point size might not be the most effective way of delivering that energy. So while we saw 305 joules per square millimetre, it, it, it could even, it could be very inefficient use of that energy. Perhaps we could sort of reduce it with a different type of laser or um, there's a lot of questions there, I guess, about uh, how that energy might change with different delivery systems and uh, different types of lasers like pulsed or, or continuous. Um, Leslie uh, asked another question. Do you think John Deere might be interested in development of some of these technologies for use in, use in niche markets initially? <laughs> um, not too sure. Can't say I've asked. Uh, but it's, it, I think it's a, globally it's an area of interest. Um, there are uh, Harper Adams in the UK are doing research on this, uh, I think with Simon Blackmore. In the, even in Australia, MLA invested in a research project with um, the New South, uh, sorry, New Zealand um, Ag Research Group for uh, literally sort of lasers on drones. Um, that again was testing very small weeds. Uh, there's been a re research in Denmark um, looking again at small weeds um, for laser weed control. And there is a, a company I think that's presenting at a uh, ag robotics conference in December called Weedbot that is uh, looking at commercialising uh, laser weed control. I think there's a number of other ones as well. These are just ones I've, I've come across on various social media channels and um, that sort of thing. So, so yeah, there is, I think, interest globally in um, new weed control methods and lasers are, are something that's being tested. Any other questions? All right. um, I've just got a, well, a final question or maybe comment. Um, and it, what would be, what's your suggestion, Guy, about the type of laser we should look at next? Is it something along the lines of the, the rust removal system that we, you showed us? Yeah, so I think, I guess the answer comes down to two things. The first is that uh, while it's great to look at lasers, um, sort of by themselves for weed control options. They do have to be in the reality of how you actually deliver that laser effectively um, at speed. And so having a point laser requires a very effective and precise detection and then also targeting and tracking of a weed um, in, in the field. So in high density weed scenario, uh, weed control scenarios, that would be uh, difficult in broad acre situations where you need the high speed unless you've got lots of robots and you completely change the fundamentals of weed control. Um, but in low weed densities, that could be plausible with, with sort of robots wandering the paddock or even um, going out there somehow and, and using it. So that, that's where point lasers, I guess, fit in. But where those line sort of scan lasers or um, those other largest point sizes uh, might fit in is that they reduce that requirement for very precise detection and targeting, uh, where you could almost, if you had that, um, that rust removal laser, you could potentially even get a weed it just to activate the laser. Um, and then as it moves over the, um, over the soil surface, uh, it could uh, control that weed. Um, so that's probably where I see that, that future at the moment anyway, is in that less precise targeting of the laser. Um, I know Sergio has just raised his hand, so he might have a comment here. Sergio is, uh, as mentioned at the start, one of the collaborators on this, this research. Yeah, it's uh, fantastic work, guys. You, you've done a lot, a lot of good work here. Um, I mean, I'm coming on that, and Chris is here too, also, which is uh, was the one who designed the first uh, laser head. Uh, I think that you can also look at into a dynamic uh, type of uh, focus laser, right? The same way that you are working in detecting the weed uh, by using machine learning tools, you could also have an optical system that change from a line scanner to a point source depending on the on the type of field that you are uh, carrying. I don't see that that would be something extremely difficult. It will require a bit of research and investment, but it's doable. It's something that uh, adaptive optics in that sense, in changing from line to point, they, they already exist. 
So it's something that you can actually look ahead and implement in the case, the need that you have for your uh, battle of field uh, to, to tackle the, the weights. Uh, right? So that's yeah. actually a possibility. Yeah. Yeah, I think one of the, the interesting things I've learned is that the scan is that the scanning head you, you're talking about there, Sergio. That, uh, yeah, you can you can have a, there is no reason why you cannot have an optical system that will go from a sort of line type uh, focus point to a, a spot one right? by playing with uh, what is called that uh, uh, cylindrical lenses of thematism. So you can actually play a game on that. So and that's something that could be designed somehow with obviously with looking at the right uh, optical properties and uh, parameters, but. I don't see why uh, you should have one only system, but something that can actually dynamically change with the needs that you have. Yeah, no, that's a very good point. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? It sort of adds to the, uh, well, the flexibility of using lasers and supports the these activities, Guy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, good comment, Sergio. Thanks for that. Yeah, thank you. All right. Okay, um, doesn't look like there's any more questions or comments. So, um, yeah, happy with that guy? Yeah, no, thanks everyone for listening in and um, hopefully it was enjoyable. And as I mentioned, feel free to get in contact and ask any more questions. All right, good work, Guy. And um, thank you both to Guy and Michael for the seminars today. And thank you all for, for joining in. And um, yeah, it's a uh, compulsory sitting ovation for their presentations today. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. See you all next time.